Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of our Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright Reading Group Series. Today is Saturday the 7th of August 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We finally finish our discussion of Chapter 1 From Grand Paradigm Battles to Pragmatist Realism Towards an Integrated Class Analysis. The link to the Google Slides we use are in the show notes. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes, joining in the patron-only reading series, or creating Discord over on the Discord server, why not head on over to Patreon throw me a few commie dollars. It keeps the books on my shelf and the food on the table. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. We're on the final, final two slides now. American class structure. Okay, so... The labor movement enabled unionized workers in those jobs to acquire income and security similar to the credentialed middle class. So this is talking about this golden era, or I presume, of American American economy. Historically, had one of the largest middle classes among the developed countries. Like, do you know what's very interesting? Like, very telling. If you go look at historical Gini calculations, you go back to like the late 60s. Do you know which of the two most equal countries in the world? Ahead of Sweden, Soviet right? Union and the and United States of America. Sorry, sorry, capitalist capitalist country. Sorry, was the UK and America. They were more <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. Just I mean, the, the the fifties actually does make third worldism seem legitimate. It just only lasts for ten years. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, like, that is kind of staggering. Like, you to drive around the UK and to think it was one of the most equal that it was like it was somehow like Scandinavia equivalent now is impossible to believe i was yeah, that is gobsmacked hard. yeah but that's 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 the that's the historical genie stuff okay the labor movement never organized more than about 35 percent of the non-managerial labor force yep that comes up in a bunch of different people who are from the analytic tradition and also communization theorists yeah this is the internal limit of the workers movement and then notes i'm sorry did i say internal i meant external limit of the workers movement it's the external limit Okay, the educational system organized such that the poor receive vastly inferior quality than the middle to the upper classes. Why the hell do we pro- we do it by zip code and property tax? Duh. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's <laughs> that is very shocking to a European person. No joking, like that. I don't know any European country that your school's taxes are based on your local taxes. That is just that is kind of like if when you t- say that to people in, in like in Europe, they. They just cannot believe that is the case, you know? Well, it's an outgrowth of the strict racial segregation of redlining. It's not just that, because it was, even states that didn't have significant minority populations still did the exact same thing. There's only like three states that even mitigate property tax as the basis for their educational inputs. And so we can explain that somewhat in terms of race, but you can't explain it totally in terms of race. It's because I think they realized pretty quickly with the racial examples that you could also keep poor people down with it pretty effectively. Yeah. Okay. And the U.S. class structure characterized by the highest rates of poverty and economic marginality of any comparable country. Like that's that's today, current, but not today, historic. Today, yeah. yeah not today. yeah. Exactly. Today, yeah. not not in the fifties. Yeah. Although yeah. I would add that, like, you you do have to not include china because they're geo their gini coefficient and their rural poverty is higher but our india so you have to you have to accept that the comparable countries to the united states is europe and and east asian small nations and not not actual nations of similar size which is india and china as well which are normally bracketed out of these comparisons that's yeah. the only caveat i would add like i would if, say if also- anything the outlier is the uk I would I would say that the as well like the ones you're talking about India and China are still largely peasant societies. India is a still a still a peasant society. Would China's probably fifty fifty now? Is it? It's less than that. It's like forty eight. It's like forty sixty now. But it, it's still really high for for a country that is as developed as it is. Kind of imagine that it might come down in China as they become maybe less peasant. Let have that strict divide where places like the U.S. and the U.K. have got. No goddamn excuse. <laughs> you know? It's like it's like a different process that their genie seems to be there, but maybe not. Maybe it's all interlinked. It'd be interesting to see what the how the how that works in China with their uh, 
uh, rising organic composition of capital, what it means going forward. And yeah, politics. India is currently having a minor revolt of peasant smallholders right now. So yeah, not mm -hmm. even minor. The biggest one in human history, or something. Well, I mean, I yeah. mean minor in in the sense that it it's not threatening to fundamentally destabilize the entire. Given how how large the actual like protest movement is, did they have something like? Was it something like two hundred? It's, like, it's like a quarter billion people, or something like that, yeah, or, or like, like somehow involved in this. Um, oh, almost know. the entirety of the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so wild. It's uh -huh. like, oh yeah, how many multiples of the entire population of Canada is that? Like, <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's like it's like literally, uh, it's like literally a hundred times Irish population are out in the streets. Yeah, like, and it's still not even a plurality of India. It's like. That's like a really just bizarre thing to think about in the sense that like, like what if India like didn't have a national movement and didn't become a single country? I mean, I guess it didn't, but like mostly one country, right? Like, would you get a, a quarter billion people joining in a single protest movement? That nope. is... Yeah, so like no, you'd you'd be looking at like five to six dozen distinct countries in the Indian subcontinent if, if there yes. wasn't a national movement. A national movement created by colonialism, basically. Like, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's the dialectic. We're gonna to have to move on. No, finally in intensified by enduring racism. Y yeah, duh. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, about Wait, that. That right, G I mean, that, that genie coefficient during the fifties. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna point out because the reeds actually do have good stats on this. They still the the black community still relative to its historical standard got more of it than it's presented now as getting, just not as much as white people. It, which is why actually the black community's big period of derationalization is the 70s, and then the worst is actually the worst period of loss of black wealth is the last 10 years, mostly yes. in the Obama yes. administration. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. Mostly because mostly because the 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 biggest burden of the home ownership crisis of the last you know ten fifteen years was pretty specifically like the black community because they were the sort of like last into the the home ownership market and they got the brunt of the shittiest loan deals. Right. And when the Obama administration refused to bail out homeowners and instead bailed out the home lenders the black community was hit the hardest by it. Right. And I, I've actually pointed this out to people who, who like talk about, you know, class people never have an answer to racial problems. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Slavery and Jim Crow removed you from the ability to participate in what, eight to 10 generations of wealth accumulation. And then you got screwed in the two generations you were allowed to participate in wealth generation by getting hit the hardest by the last housing bubble, because the housing markets where we put all of our freaking wealth. So like, you just got doubly screwed and, but you know, since it was done with intersectional posturing, you guys won't criticize that. I don't know. Maybe class does explain what's happening to black people a little bit. Right. And to your point about the, uh, the, the black communities in the fifties, I mean, think about like the Harlem Renaissance and black wall street. Like these are regions within like the, the black America that experienced pretty massive economic booms. It was just not, it was just not as big relative to the white working class, the white America, essentially. Although the Harlem Renaissance is earlier, right? But yeah, Har know. Harlem but, Renaissance yeah. and, Black, and Black Wall Street is actually er earlier than that. There is the revitalization of Black communities in the 50s. But again, like it was still very slow and anemic compared to white America. That's I think that's where you have to zone in to explain what happened. The, the, the breakdown was not equal. But if you look at benefits across the board i think the people that you could say were totally excluded is actually indigenous because they were just to like that's like the high point of indigenous getting messed up yeah that's kind of that is actually sort of what i was thinking about when i was saying that so i mean yeah i could i could accept that rising tide lifts all boats when it comes to black america during the 50s <laughs> I, i'm sorry i almost threw up but but with indigenous communities that's just i mean if we were talking about the original sin of primary accumulation in the united states we we know what that's about well, I, I, I saw recently a couple of episodes of Lovecraft Country and, you know, you see the black neighborhoods there. They look really nice in the 1950s and the the clothes they're wearing are so fashionable. They all look great. That's what I think. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I'm sure that's what the show was was trying to trying to put forward. I don't know. I haven't <laughs> seen Love. I haven't seen Lovecraft Country. Okay, finally, we're on the. This is the final one. The challenges. Yes. The challenges of an integrated class analysis. First of all, we're hit with this point. Marx has sometimes claimed the mantle of a comprehensive paradigm of social science, defended with the rhetoric of incommensurable paradigms. Um, I think this this point has been so influential on me. There's a paragraph from the beginning of the chapter that I would like to read. Can I read the paragraph? When I began writing about class in the mid 1970s, I saw Marxism as a comprehensive paradigm confronting positivist social science. While I argued that this battle should be engaged on empirical as well as theoretical terrain, I viewed Marxism and mainstream sociology as foundationally distinct and incommensurable warring paradigms. Looking back in the mid eighties at this earlier work, I wrote, I originally had visions of glorious paradigm battles with lances drawn and the valiant Marxist knight unseating the bourgeois rival in a dramatic quantitative joust. What is more, the fantasy saw the vanquished admitting defeat and changing horses as a result. I just want to add a, a small addendum to that, which is that this idea of intellectual change would not really be that implausible in, say, the 60s. Because sure. you had seen something like the institutionalists in America, which were previously the dominant school of economics, unseated in exactly this manner by the neoclassicals. So like this, the, it, it's not to say that this kind of paradigm shift does not happen. It does. It's just it didn't, it didn't happen there. And, it, and like Eric Olin writes other points about Marxism not being actually that distinct maybe totally valid. I'm just saying it's yeah. not as silly as he makes it sound. I have a lot of sympathy for where that generation of scholars are coming from. But I think that his sobriety about this is like a well-worn lesson of those times, you know, and like the idea totally. of this would be a heroic, you know, fact-finding jousting match, which will dethrone bourgeois sociology and establish Marxist class analysis, you know, is displacing all those other mechanisms. And, I also want to say that this yeah. is exactly what actually happened in reverse to Marxists in many parts of the world with the fall of the, the Soviet Union. So, yeah, these things happen. They're just not the way that he envisioned. Yeah. You certainly wouldn't expect them to happen for somebody who was like, you know, like a Marxist analysis is going to win the battle in, in a bourgeois scientific environment, even if they were right. You would, you would never expect them to override the superstructure. You wouldn't expect that, but there, there, Kyle, isn't there like a whole tradition of like historiography in Japan that was essentially dominated by Marxists, even though it was capitalist? Yeah, it's because of special circumstances. So like, mm -hmm. first of all, Marx was the only person because of the theory of modes of production to have a a kind of like historically variegated understanding of progression or of development, which is why Weberian sociology became a thing in the United States, because they were like, oh no, we need development theory mm -hmm. to fight the Marxists uh, explicitly. And so that was attractive to the Japanese in the way that other theories were not. The other thing that we have to to remember is that Japan was one of those border countries between the state socialist world and the capitalist world, which allowed there for there to be like two parallel forms of, of the academy. But you're absolutely right that like in the early pre-World War II okay. period, even when Japan was firmly capitalist, not surrounded by uh, socialist states, because of that sort of like well, where do we fit into this picture question? Marx was uh, very uh, attractive and influential to everyone and not just, you know, hardcore labor activists. Yeah, I was about to say, even in the United States, in historiography proper, not, not in sociology, in historiography proper, Marxism is still considered the most advanced but failed form of historiography. And there's nothing that has, quote unquote, risen to replace it. I mean, you know, it wasn't even hard for Heidegger to say that. 
in fact, if you think about it from even Tom's point of view, granting your opponent legitimacy, but then saying, well, we don't have anything to replace it, but they still fail. But look how awesome what they they achieved, they tried to do is, but look, it destroyed the world. So we just we shouldn't try this at all is a pretty useful rhetorical technique. To just sort of circle back to the, the ultimate point here is that integrating Marxist stuff into good science, essentially, is the only way you're ever going to get like this kind of class analysis to be taken seriously, not just in America, but now I'm thinking about the ex-communist countries where they had this grand paradigm battle in the exact reverse way to which, you know, right thought it was going to happen. The only way you're ever going to get this stuff back in vogue in a way that isn't totally fucking reactionary would be to actually integrate it into the body of social science. It's just the only way that that's going to happen. And Wright lays out a, what he calls a virtue centric synthesis. Basically, you know, you look at what different class analyses do right and try to systematize from there. So yeah, I think, I, I just, I just think this is, you know, we've been talking a lot about dialectics so-called, but like, I think the difference between, you know, lowercase d like dialectics in the Marxist sense that isn't exactly Hegelian dialectics or blah, 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 whatever. Like, the good virtuous sense of dialectics is its ability to bring together a lot of conflicting tendencies. And the bad thing about capital D dialectics is that it's supposed to be this comprehensive paradigm that shuts out and, you know, closes its ears la, 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 to all the other like tendencies and thought, which again, big D dialectics carries the stamp of cold war ideology through and through. Whereas, you know, the previous notion has something to do with good scientific practice. And I, I find the whole anti-dialectics framing really dodgy because inevitably we're going to move between these two notions of dialectics. Mm -hmm. So like at this point, emergent social science means a lot of the things Marx was getting at in, you know, dialectics is part like those kinds of feedback loops. It's part of how people do social science now. It's not always well done, but it's there. We don't need a special methodology to get there anymore. If, you know, if that was ever really a useful thing. I don't know. I, I still think it's a useful thing because I, I, I still see where this goes, Esri. I think, you, I think you're, you're too soft and you're right. Um, I mean, the methodological nationalism thing leads directly into the trap we're going to get into at the end of this book. Yeah. Like, the yeah. There's a bunch trap. of, there's a bunch the of traps. Trap. There's a bunch of trap. Yeah. The trap. Yeah, trap. The, there's the, a bunch the, of traps. Capital trap too. The like not being able to talk about value relations, but again, that's an emergentist tendency in a capitalist economy. I have respect for E.O. Wright because, you know, he was a sociologist defending the existing labor theory of value in public, then realized that literature is garbage. You could be a TSSI person or a value form person and basically agree. I would say as well, it's like, it's not like Marx didn't situate capital firmly within like classical political economy. That the fact that your your research or stuff is kind of integrated into whatever, even if it's goddamn quantum physics, yeah, it's like the, the fact that if you have like a Marxist or dialectical approach, it's not a problem that you're sitting in bourgeois science. Just simply cannot you cannot exclude yourself from it. Marx didn't I, I think, any reason for it. I think what we're actually talking about is the negative dynamics of a stalemate. Yep, mm -hmm. where the tendency towards partisanship sort of like, you know, goes sour and everything becomes internally referential to the paradigm. Right. Um, and that's because of the stalemate. And the way out was to lose for the Marxists. Yeah. Seriously, which, yeah, it was. Which, which had... Yeah which had positive intellectual consequences in some ways because it actually removed those dilemmas of being stuck in a stalemate and all of like that weird cult shit that was said in it. Because I don't think we can take, I don't think we can look. So speaking as somebody who studied a lot of intellectual history, which is a weird discipline, but I think it has like one thing that's useful to look at is that partisanship in intellectual endeavors is just like endemic to what intellectual endeavors are 
And it's not necessarily self-destructive. But I think in the Cold War situation, you got into that stalemate where it did become self-destructive. And then, yeah, like, as you're saying, Ezri, like, actually the collapse of the Marxist paradigm did give way to room through systems theory and cybernetics for emergentist theories to become mainstream. So that was yeah. like a positive outcome of that defeat. Yeah, it's the strange victory of dialectics. The, the dialectics victory. of defeat, you might say. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, well, we should, we should, we should go through Another book the... we should read one day. No, that's fine. Next point. Let's move it on. Marxism's power comes from its ability to provide powerful explanations for an array of phenomena, not because it is epistemologically unique. That is something yeah. I believe deeply. I think that that it should be a duh. It should be a duh, but it is very much not. I know. Well, I, I know, but this I is basically a suck it Trotsky. It's, <laughs> like, yes, this we'll is suck it, it is. To, to the entire Leninist tradition, more or less. Yeah. Uh, well, well, weirdly, Maoists actually don't claim ep epistemic uniqueness to Marxism in the same way that most Soviet Leninists do. Um, whether or not they're, I, I, I mean, I got the sense from Mao's own writings that they would have every reason to. Not in the same way, no. I mean, like that's why Mao's own writings read like folk religion, though, because they avoid making epistemic claims. Well, they are so unlike their Maoists. They're so un they're so unlike their Mao, I suppose. Yeah, but even uh, even when you even when you read contemporary Maoists, like what what do they do to justify like J. Paul Mafad? How does he justify his weird immortal science claims? It's a mixture of Soviet stuff and then like actual appears to weird bourgeois stuff. Like he goes into popper as somehow proving Marx. I mean, but I've hilarious. I've also I've also read like some <laughs> incredibly bong rip Maoism. I I think this might be less true of Maoists, but I don't think it's universally true of Maoists because well, I've seen bon Maoists claim mean, that doesn't mean I've, like epistemic uniqueness. It j also could be just insane. But I've seen the epistemic uniqueness argument from Maoists, so it probably depends on your you know, 37 flavors of Maoists or whatever. Right. Well, I mean, that's like, true for, for any of these, right? I mean, like, Trotsky has had the Cliffite tradition, which gave up on dialectics. Using they, Popper to back up your, like, Marxist claims, given that Popper used his claims to destroy Marxist claims, <laughs> that is quite, that's quite the turnaround. It's yeah. It's probably dialectical. But, um, JMP do be do that. But I mean, I, I, I do I do just want to say that like epistemically unique is a possible definition of insanity. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> they're not necessarily distinct. Well, I just you know one of the, the critical the theory be that I think Yara and the scripts goes to, and also Marx himself talked about is Marx is highly dependent on classical economics, French French political theory. Yeah, in German idealist philosophy, with the with this big caveat that like Marx also like his epistemic theory is basically Aristotle. It really mm -hmm. is. Like it's Aristotle plus Hegel. It's the Hegelian yeah. understanding of Aristotle. And if you don't get that, there's all kinds of claims Marx makes that doesn't make sense, but he's not claiming epistemic uniqueness. Like he's really not, and even Ingalls isn't claiming epistemic uniqueness. He's claiming like a total field theory of science, but like <laughs> he doesn't say we have the right epistemology, our theory of knowledge. He says dialectics allows us to reach certain. I mean, I guess in some ways it's functionally the same thing, but yeah, like by the time by the time he's doing like metaphysics and calling it science, you know, there's like a whole series of conflations, and I think epistemology is one of those links. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying. That's not how they argue it. Okay, next point. Liberian sociologists have not aspired to create a comprehensive paradigm, satisfied with a rich menu of loosely connected concepts and addressing specific empirical and historical problems. Bing, 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 they're pragmatist. Which right. is why I don't trust cash value thought. <laughs> What's the cash value of not trusting cash value thought? He's looking at somebody there, but I'm not sure who. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Kyle. <laughs> I, I, like, Kyle I just like saying cash value because it upsets Marxists. Uh, oh, right. Uh, pragmatism is really interesting, but it does always, I don't know, it does always 
you also get into varieties of pragmatism and yeah. Yeah, well, uh, well Peirce was a Hegelian pragmatist, which is crazy fun, but like yeah. pragmatist <laughs> pragmatism in general was considered it comes um, out of Hegel, out of yeah. Hegel for sure. Yeah. 100% well, it comes out of Hegel. <laughs> yeah. It was considered like crypto Hegelianism essentially. Uh, well, so but no, of... like even Dewey was not crypto. Dewey was just a Hegelian because that was the <laughs> normal thing to be in the U.S. at the time because it was a way to be kind of Christian, but also kind of not. Yeah, and, I was about to say, yeah, all yeah. the transcendentalists are all like, th that's Hegelian mysticism for idiots. You mean Americans? I don't know. I just know that I'm allergic to to pragmatism because all of the like self identified neoliberals that I know call right. themselves pragmatists, and they're they like everything that we believe, we believe because because it is pragmatic and empirically backed, and all this like other well, ideas. Well, I mean, that's the bullshit. problem with with uh, pragmatism, except in purse, is is it, it mm -hmm. cash value is a circular concept. <laughs> Yeah, like, no, what is you, useful you, is what I think is useful. So eugenics as <laughs> pragmatism. Read Louis Menand's history of the transcendentalist and protagonist, the American what is it, the uh, metaphysical club. Uh, eugenics actually is rooted, has a pragmatist mm -hmm. argument behind it entirely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so I mean it, it it should be noted that Wright calls himself a pragmatist realist, essentially, when it comes to his philosophy of science. So this is all relevant. This is all relevant to why we might be skeptical walking into right and hearing himself call himself some kind of pragmatist. Yeah. But pragmatist so realist sounds like Dewey. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. means so, bourgeois traitor. No. Um. Yes. yes no, <laughs> Get no, out the knives! <laughs> that's, that's definitely what I want people to take away from this is that, well, I, I, well what he said seems interesting, but then he used the wrong adjective to describe himself, so we have to kill him. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure that tradition is alive and well, even outside of Marxism on the left. <laughs> You see, yeah. you know, like we've chosen like a, a text that we end. We, we I think we all kind of disagree with in the end. So we're going to have so many gulag references in thirty-two goddamn episodes that are projected. <laughs> let's be let's be clear about this. There's going to be a lot of times where we we, we call him a traitor. What, uh, it's funny, it's it. funny about right though to defend him just a little bit while I'm calling him a bourgeois traitor. Is this book opened up an array for of problems for me that other books we've even discussed on this. Like, when, I don't know, when I read the McNair text and the Kleiman text for the third times, those were both my third times reading through, I, I got way madder at them than either of the first two times. This is my third time reading this, and I'm like, eh, I was right. Like, I feel pretty much the same about it as the first time. This first three chapters are, are blew my mind and, and led me down to really creative things to deal with about reconciling Bourdieu, which which I think E.O. Wright just reads wrong, for example, and, and other theorists of, of class with Marxism that I thought was helpful and in a way that you could defend Marxism. But by the end of the book, I still kind of am like, but you're still a traitor. <laughs> it's going to be tough on you, Esri. It's going to be tough on you. <laughs> you know what, though? It's not, because I engaged with analytical Marxism as a sort of like black pill, and I was very upset I was trying to figure out how dialectics, you know, and dialectical thought could be marshaled to defend precious prejudices, and I couldn't defend it. And so engaging with the analytical Marxists, being very upset with their conclusions, made me think, okay, I have two options here if I want to maintain my convictions. It's either I assert a whole different epistemology or I have to accept some of the premises that the analytical Marxists are putting forward and not others. And I find one of these strategies much more effective for not only arguing my point to others, but to asking myself, do I really believe that these convictions have any referent in the real world? Or am I just, am I just essentially religious? Is this just like a, an exercise in, well, I believe something. So even if it's impossible, I don't care, you know, like, well, yeah. what what about what about these convictions means anything uh, yeah I, well i mean that's the whole point of this enemy uh enemy camp series right <laughs> well, <laughs> so oh, it's a cross pod ooh. joke yeah, yeah. Uh, no no yeah. but uh you know like i i've said this before on other podcasts but like the way that i got to like socialism was was that i argued so hard against ancaps that i destroyed like the the little liberal in my head that said 
but actually some of their arguments are good. So, yeah, yeah. actually mine was dealing with um, paleo conservatives and then also like thinking about John Locke a lot and going, that doesn't make any goddamn sense. Like, how do you, how, how, how do you justify property off of use when like you're living through the enclosure period and writing about it at the time and you're just not lying? Question mark. That's how kind of I got here. But to 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 defend Esri to agree with you, like I think I'm more black pilled on Marxism sometimes than you are, even though I'm the person who argues like the most stringently for everybody sticking to their Marxist categories exactly. Yeah. Because I don't like people trying to use wiggle room to save something that doesn't work. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I, I think my problem with analytical Marxism it has tended to be it tries to have this both ways to whether or not it's Marxist or not. And also, a lot of it doesn't end up being true. As you said, what won the analytical Marxist day was ultimately defeated in the general sphere of social science overall. Yep. Yeah, but in a, in a way that, like, when you read through the way that the analytical Marxist debates proceed internally gives ammo to the more, like, orthodox side. Like, yeah. that's the interesting thing. And, like, one of the big, one of the big sticking points is that, oh, like... Like in, in all of their like sort of political backs and forth is that, oh, well, you know, the economy's doing fine and, you know, labor unions give you good rights. So, I mean, what's the problem? And then, you know, you're reading these texts from 1979 and like the ashes of like class consciousness in 2008. You're like, wow, all their reasons for like a lot of their some you have to pick apart some of their reasons for their more, con, you know, conservative political conclusions still hold. But a lot of them don't. <laughs> a lot of them don't anymore. Like, like, for example, Romer defeating equilibrium theory, which even capitalists don't believe in anymore. It's like, right. <laughs> let's move on, but we're going to get stuck in this. So exploitation is not figured centrally in Weberian analysis, but there's no fundamental to including it. Hashtag barrier. lol. Yeah, there's no <laughs> fundamental barrier to including exploitation in Weberian analysis. Lol. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I found that line very funny. As in, like, <laughs> there's nothing to stop me from being a Marxist except that I'm a bourgeois. <laughs> well, plenty uh, of bourgeois or Marxists. Come on. You know, I'm joking. You know, I'm making a, I'm making a joke. I think this point is kind of a, a really, I, I don't know. It just seems like an incredibly naive point to me on some, it's, on some level. Well, yes and no. Like, because, okay, so for, I think the two points kind of go together, right? It's like Weberian sociologists do not have a comprehensive paradigm and also do not think about exploitation. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, maybe this is actually a core thing that's like anchoring the social fabric. But yeah, like I think it's it's like, I guess what we're doing here in terms of talking about like, oh yeah, like, you know, private property rights are a special form of the Viberian case. It's not like you can't logically do that. I think if you were a sociologist who was being trained in the existing academy and looking for a job, you probably wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, like there's no... I, I don't know if I would say fundamental is the correct word to use there. It's like there's like no logical barrier to doing it, right? Yeah, but there is a fundamental barrier to yes, doing it. Yes, 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 exactly. Which is getting a job and having academic success. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's the barrier. Which it's might actually make sense from a Weberian perspective of that <laughs> opportunity hoarding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't want those yokels, those proles. <laughs> Only the traitor proles, please. No, well, there it is. I don't know. I think that, like, you can do a lot of damage to Weberian sociology by creating a neo-Marxism that incorporates all of Weberian sociology with an underlying exploitation mechanism. Yeah, like, it, it seems to me that, like, it's not so much that Marx doesn't deal with these Weberian schemes uh, much, but that it's just not his central focus, that they come in on the edges. There are parts, I think, where, like, some of uh, this opportunity hoarding type stuff 
is intrinsically incorporated, you know, and maybe throw, you know, a sentence here and there is thrown to it. But Marx was looking at the exploitation as the fundamental driver of these things. It's not like I don't look at Weber and Weber's idea of opportunity hoarding and go, I say no to that. That's not Marxism. I just kind of go like, yeah, this is like a, you know, just a a, a component. Uh, I just think that, that that it just slots in kind of without any problems. I don't see. I don't see any issue with incorporating it. I don't know if I'm missing something, but like, what do other people reckon? Well, at the at the end of the chapter here, Eo write, uh, writes, Marxism remains a distinctive tradition of doing social science because of its distinctive set of problems, its normative foundations, and its distinctive inventory concepts and mechanisms that it has de- deployed. And I think that's that's generally true, like, you know, what we were saying before about it not being epistemically unique. It's that it is it is unique in in what it chooses to look at and some of the the methodological choices that it uses to look at them. And, you know, adding in different adding in a different focus doesn't necessarily fundamentally change it being a an analysis coming out of the Marxist tradition to incorporate sort of a, a Weberian lens on what you're actually seeing. Yeah, like when I actually have discussions with people about the role of like professionals and managers in society, what they're always afraid of is that I'm arguing the PMC thesis or something. And it's like, no, 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 no. We can account for these things in reality without short circuiting and stopping ourselves from asking the fundamental questions Marxists are asking. There's no contradiction there. It's like a, it's like some kind of academic culture war. It's, I, there's an ideological block to doing this. Yeah, it's, we just have to about, be pragmatically real about it, right? No, 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 no. If, dentists, if, if, dentists are not doctors. I will say that. And doctors aren't dentists. <laughs> Fuck you guys. <laughs> well, like, I, if this is what pragmatic realism is, sure. I don't know if I'd describe it as that, but if that's what it, if that's what it is, then fucking fine. Like, you just can't say that the Weberian stuff doesn't matter. Like a lot of Marxists want to. Mm. And if you do that, you look like a fucking moron because are people today like in America, super concerned, like for the most part about how exploited they are. No, they're usually like concerned with how exploited they're not like, please, I need some exploitation. I need to pay for things in my life. And the only way I can do it right now is to, you know, get this, get this job. For Joe Biden. <laughs> That's really like, like, please, I need a job. Like, uh, yeah, the only thing worse than being exploited under capitalism is not being exploited under capitalism. Yeah, Joan Robinson. Yeah. Right. Or, like, or, get, or getting shot and slaughtered in the face by capitalism. Well, there's yeah. that too. But well, there's <laughs> yeah, that too. But we, we're talking after the, you know, this is. We're it. talking 1950s here. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right, but just to say one last thing about pragmatism, I, I think that the the biggest issue is that the vast majority of people who call themselves pragmatists are basically just like obscuring the fact that they're not challenging or acknowledging like the ideology and the ideological assumptions that are underlying everything that they do. So if someone wants to call themselves a pragmatist and actually like explicates their ideological assumptions and like brings those into their arguments in a way that you can obviously see that they are at least grappling with it at some level. I'm not that, I don't really have that big of an issue with it, but pragmatism is, is often just a way to say like, Oh, you know, I, or like, I'm not being political here or. That's not even like the way in which he means pragmatism. He's talking about a specific sort of methodological tradition. Yeah, Most I, 99 I, times out of a hundred people like I'm a pragmatist. It's just like, you know, yuppie business speak for I'm effective. I don't let my brain get in the way of success. Like, right, right. No. And I was, I was just saying that that's why I'm not yeah. really, I don't really have that big of an issue with it being yeah. here. It's just, it's just, you know, I do have an allergy to it because 99% of the time that's what pragmatism means. Yes. Well, there's a few things like, first of all, we have to remember that Dewey defended Trotsky against uh, <laughs> being yeah. persecuted by the American <laughs> state. Uh, like Dewey was pretty friendly to Marxists, even though he didn't agree with them entirely. I think there are some 
fundamental differences of concern between Marxism and pragmatism, where doing pragmatism tends to lead you into, I guess it's just, it's not exactly idealism, but like lots of focus on epistemology, lots of focus on how do we know things, lots of focus on like, well, what are our concepts really? And how do they connect to action? And how does that connect to democracy? Which is like tangentially related to all the concerns of Marxism, but they don't, it's like Marxists and pragmatists tend to look at different things, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily opposed to each other. I would say that I've listened to hundreds of hours of Chomsky lectures in my time. Um, Chomsky's not a pragmatist, is he? He quotes Dewey all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, he quotes Dewey, and you know who else he quotes all the time? The Limits to State Action by, what's your man's name? Wilhelm von Humboldt. Oh, yeah. So, like, Chomsky probably only ever mentions Marx in kind of an argument with a Marxist, essentially. Yeah, he has nothing positive to say about Marx, yeah. Yeah, he's he's pretty pretty anti-Marxist. Like um, he's not anti he's anti Marxists, but he's not anti Marx when they actually get into discussing yeah. Marx. That's the way I would put it. Well, yeah, yeah but, but he he also doesn't he doesn't I, draw on Marx much at all. Uh, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, nearly never. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, he, he doesn't he doesn't actually engage with like uh, Marxist theory at all. He's he's engaging at the level of like Marxist people. Yes, and also he actually really goes against against Hegel, you know. Yeah. Actually, quotes Hegel, which is later. very funny, but very never funny Marx. given his uh, his his uh, love affair with Dewey. I mean, Dewey Dewey claimed to be like post Hegelian because of his of the influence of Darwin on his thought. Like he thought that Darwin gave him a way to break out of the Hegel idealism trap, but. I think there's a lot of Dewey that's still pretty damn Hegelian. So, yeah. If I were to say just two things here is that, yes, uh, pragmatists are more focused on epistemology. Marxists, when they're not Cold War ideologues, are more focused on, you know, like the structuring of class ultimately. And, of course, their normative commitments, which a lot of pragmatists don't have. Um, and a lot of Marxists say they don't have, but they're lying. And then the second thing I'd say is that Chomsky probably isn't interested in Marx because Marxism during his time was essentially marshaled as an argument for why it was cool for Lenin to destroy the councils, which is what he considered socialism to be. Chomsky mm -hmm. wrote the AK Press introduction to, to Anton Panikowicz's Workers, Workers Councils. Councils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that famous back and forth between Chomsky and some, you know, frothing at the mouth spart in his audience. Oh, it's, yeah. just all, it's just all about how Lenin destroyed socialism. Lenin destroyed the possibility for the councils to become the basis of, you know, political and economic decision making. So and there's there's the, there's the idealism in Chomsky and no understanding of actual material. You know, like, I mean, seriously, that's like it's such an idealistic attack. It's it's kind of incredible. It's so non-materialist. I, I, I don't think I don't think it is. It's just that, like, obviously, because of the existence of Panacoic, you could be a Marxist. And think that <laughs> Panacook thinks that and is a Marxist. Yeah, but I don't think there. I think like you know, you know, uh, like I'm no Leninist. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, but, like, but I don't think you can look at like Lenin's actions outside of the material conditions. And like Chomsky, I, I in that I, essentially I think, makes the point. Like in that in I that argument. In an, in the, but in that argument, he talks about how Lenin wrote one thing to get people on side for him, and then he reverted quickly back to the right because that was his true nature. Like that's quite. I think a, that's basically right. I think, I, and I, I was, I'm an ex-Leninist. I think that is basically right, and I, I've struggled with that for like a decade. There's just one period where Lenin is cool, and then he flips back to being his old self. Anyway, oh, I'm, maybe I'm just, maybe you've read more Lenin than me, but I, I, I I'm, uh, yeah, I, I just think. I, I do think Chomsky has big idealism vibes. That's what I would say. Overall, from listening to literally hundreds of hours of lectures. Oh, yeah, like politically speaking. Like, yeah, he's, yeah. he's much more of like a, pra yeah, he's much more of one of these pragmatists. Yes. Like, but he, he's got stronger normative commitments than most of them. But yeah. 
definitely. Well, I'm I'm fully on this council communist vibe at the moment, so don't take any of what I'm saying as not. I'm 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 literally going to. I bought a couple of books. I said I would never buy books. Said I would finish that goddamn bookshelf staring at me, and I <laughs> I relented, and I've gone yeah, and bought three fucking I, books this week. I feel I feel like I've pancake pilled you. The Swampside fandom has has pancake pilled you. I had that book. Tony Pancake had, is Bay, but but Tom it. Because of your accent, it sounded like you said cancel Marxists or cancel communists. Oh, <laughs> cancel oh yeah, communists. cancel communists. <laughs> and I was just like, Finally. you know what? Maybe I'm not. <laughs> Finally, yeah. a, a Marxist, a, a communism I can get behind. Yeah, yeah. broke, cancel culture, yeah. bespoke, council culture. Cancel communists. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.